with New York Times best-selling author John Gilstrap and Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey. And uh, we are in the bonus hour now. Coming up in the back half of this hour, Michelle Blatt, State Superintendent of Schools. We'll get into that situation with North Middle and the news uh, that broke on that uh, about, uh, what, uh, 24 hours ago or so. Via telephone, Glenn Elliott. We spoke earlier this morning with Don Blankenship and uh, yesterday with Zach Shrewsbury. And uh, they comprised the three Democrats who are running in the Democratic primary for the Senate seat currently held by uh, Joe Manchin. Glenn Elliott is the person who received the endorsement of the uh, current uh, holder of that seat, Joe Manchin. Glenn, good morning to you. How are you feeling today, sir? Uh, Rob, good morning. I'm feeling pretty good. The endorsement from Senator Manchin. Glenn, can you tell me how that came about? Uh, Sure. You know, I've developed a a pretty good relationship with the senator, uh, you know, during the past eight years that I've been mayor. Um, you know, he has been an incredible federal partner to work with. His staff is, uh, you know, he has people on the ground and ground Wheeling. And we've worked with his office to bring literally tens of millions of dollars of a federal funding to Wheeling. So, um, you know, when, uh, you know, after he decided not to seek reelection, I did reach out to him and say, you know, uh, what do you think about me going after this seat as well? And he encouraged me to get into this race. And then he offered his endorsement. So, if, uh, you know, I was obviously uh, uh, very honored to have it. Um, you know, he's, um, you know, done a lot of things, um, you know, I like his predecessor, Senator Byrd. He's really used that seat to bring a lot of resources back to West Virginia. And, you know, I used to work for Senator Byrd, and and so I have some appreciation of the power of that particular Senate seat. And, um, you know, there's a lot of economic investment happening across the state right now, thanks to him and President Biden. I I know if you read the paper sometimes, you'd think the governor's responsible for all of it. But, you know, a lot of these big um, investments like Nucor and Form. And Form Energy may not have happened without Senator Manchin there, um, you know, being one of the key votes in the Senate. So I'm really appreciative of his efforts in that regard. You mentioned Form Energy, and there are a few things that divide Republicans more than Form Energy in this state, Glenn. (laughs) Uh, Clearly, though, with you citing it, uh, you are a person who advocates for this deal. However, as I said, in the Republican Party, there are many who would disagree with you. In fact, one of our guests earlier this morning cited Form Energy as the reason why she wanted to run for the House of Delegates here. Tell me about the good things well, about Form Energy. Uh, in terms of the good things, uh, you know, uh, you're looking at where it's being invested. You're looking at a place that was always known for industry, like uh, the northern panhandle, especially the Weirton area, was always known uh, you know, as an industrial backbone of the state, and you know it's fallen on on very hard times. So we need to be thinking outside the box to bring, uh, you know, new sorts of companies in. Now, some of the issues with the deal, I think, some of the opposition on the Republican side have to do either uh, uh, with the politics of of some of the owners of the company, or with the fact that there was a subsidy involved. You know, in terms of subsidies, I think the role for government should be basically to subsidize infrastructure be it new roads, sewer lines, power lines, whatever that need to make a plan happen. I don't think that that money should necessarily go into the, uh, you know, into the bank account of, of companies coming in, but it's, it's certainly good for us to be diversifying our economy. And again, um, you know, the governor's certainly been taking credit for that project, but, you know, it, it, it doesn't happen without the federal government being there as well. Uh, same thing with Nucor, same thing with some other investments we've seen. <clears throat> um, you know, we have to have a good federal partner. I know it's, it's, um, it's very... Um, you know, easy for those on the Republican side just to blast the federal government because, you know, what's more popular in Republican circles than blasting the federal government? But, uh, you know, we were promised a lot during the Trump administration, but if you look at what's happened since President Biden's been there, th- uh, thanks in part to having a Senate majority with Senator Manchin, uh, you know, we've been able to deliver infrastructure. We, uh, here in the city of Wheeling, we got a, a, $16, million, a $16 million infrastructure grant uh, for our downtown streetscape project, which is a $32.5 million project. Uh, you know, we tried to get that t- uh, twice under the Trump administration, didn't get it. Then the first year of the Biden administration, we got that grant. So, um, you know, I'm like, I'm all about results. And, uh, you know, when it comes, you asked me about Senator Manchin, uh, he's delivered results uh, time and time again to the state. So, you know, I really appreciate that. And I, I think this particular Senate seat is so critical to have someone in there who sees uh, the potential to help, help the state through that position. Mr. Gilstrap. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> Running as a Democrat and uh, for, for the senatorial seat, you know, you're entering into what is essentially Chuck Schumer's party, Chuck Schumer's caucus. And, you know, you're entering a party that is writ large at, at the national level. It's anti-coal. It's perceived as anti-coal. There's the whole woke, woke social agenda thing. It's pro, um, pro-abortion. pro It's anti-gun. It seems to run counter with 
counter to so much of what West Virginia voters stand for. So is it your plan to somehow change that agenda of the National Democratic Party or to lean more toward the Republican caucus while you're there? I mean, how, how do you well, balance the two? I'm certainly not a Republican, but, um, you know, I would take issue with the way you've characterized Democratic issues on a lot of those uh, Democratic positions on a lot of those issues. Now, uh, Republicans are very good at defining Dem uh, Democrats as uh, as these extremists. And it, like you, you, uh, uh, you use the phrase pro-abortion. I would not. I don't know any Dem a Democrat who's pro-abortion. I think uh, most Democrats believe that women should be able to make their own reproductive si uh, uh, decisions. I think in the state of West Virginia, that's a winning argument for Democrats to make this fall. Um, you know, I know a lot of Democrats who aren't anti-gun. Um, I'm certainly not. Well, I'm you look at the Biden an administration platform. and well, no, and, and, have some, and yeah, the but, ATF priorities, yeah. right? Uh, sure, uh, but if I were elected, I could tell you this: um, if I were elected, I mean, I've met uh, Senator Schumer in the past. If I were elected, I think Senator Schumer would be so thrilled that a Democrat was able to keep this Western United seat blue um, that uh, you know you would have a lot of latitude um, uh, to vote. Um, you know what's best interest for West Virginia time and time again. Now, uh, I look. I'm a lifelong Democrat. I'm actually the only person in my primary who's uh, who's never been registered as a Republican. I'm a lifelong Democrat. I believe in the Democratic Party, uh, but a big difference between me and the, uh, pretty much every Republican running for state office right now in West Virginia is that I'm willing to stand up to the president of my party. Um, you know, I don't think uh, uh, President Biden's right on everything. An example, you mentioned Form Energy. Well, just the other a big investment up there in Weirton. I've been very cri uh, critical of President Biden for not doing anything to stop the Cleveland Cliffs um, uh, closure up there. He could have interceded and, st and overruled a decision made by the by the ITC, uh, basically not to de uh, to determine that coal, uh, the tins being dumped in America by China and Canada, and uh, I think it's Germany, it's the third country. Uh, he's not done that, and I've been very very critical of him. I've not in this entire election season, I've not heard a single Republican running for office say anything that ever criticizes President Trump. It's almost it, like impossible. So the idea that I would be beholden to my party, I find a little bit I take issue with because I'm not afraid to stand up to my party. But that, I think the bigger issue is why we don't have Republicans in the state who are ever willing to stand up to the former president on anything. They're so afraid of him. Um, it, it makes their party a lot. I look a lot much more like a cult than an actual political party that's a party of ideas. Now that's changed. That, that okay. The, yeah. For the sake of argument, stipulate all that. Now get yeah. back to the, the you still. You're still running as as a Democrat in a sure. largely red state. So, yeah. um, in, instead of talking about what Republicans aren't doing, yeah. as as a, a how do you convince the the deep red state to vote for a, a Democrat who's going to join the Schumer caucus? Yeah. Well, look, <clears throat> um, it's no doubt that in the last uh, uh, ten fifteen years. A lot of West Virginians have voted Republican. Uh, many of them are now independents. They've left the Democratic Party because they got frustrated with the party. I understand that because our party was in control of the state for something like 80 years, and we were still last in pretty much everything. Uh, we've tried Republican rule now for a while in the state. We have a supermajority. We have a Republican governor. Um, and we're still uh, you know, pretty much last in all the important metrics of health, of education, of workforce participation, uh, of income per capita. Uh, you know, We're right there with Mississippi and Alabama on all those rankings, John. So, you know, the results, we're not, we're not getting the results that we need. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, it's time, for the, it's time for Democrats to, you know, stop letting Republicans brand them as this party of extremes and pretty much reclaim the mantle of the party of the working class, of the party of the underdogs. Uh, that's what we all, like, that's what made this party, party great in the better part of the 20th century, the party of the underdogs, the party that delivered Social Security and Medicare, um, you know, the party that gave unions the right to collectively bark, you know, that's the type of Democrat I am. You know, I grew up in – my grandparents had a picture of Franklin Roosevelt hanging on the wall, and I was always intrigued by him. And then, I, of course, learned a lot about John F. Kennedy and other Democrats in high school. And, you know, that's the, that's the type of Democrat I've aspired to. West Virginia's used to vote for Democrats like that, and I certainly think there's a chance we can – uh, turn that around, especially when Republicans haven't been able to improve the lives of so many West Virginians during their time in control. Mr. Harvey. Uh, good morning, Mayor Elliott. Hey, good morning. Your, your fellow mayor of Huntington, uh, Steve Williams, is, mm -hmm. you know, obviously running for governor, and he has called and started a petition to have abortion, uh, yep. or excuse me, uh, I want, or a, a ballot measure regarding abortion. Um, do you join in that, or your thoughts on that, sir? <clears throat> 
Well, I'm 110% in support of restoring women's reproductive rights in West Virginia. I have to admit, and this is something I, you know, when I worked for Senator Byrd, um, you know, he was a student of history. He was a student of what made, what, uh, what made our country great, and he was not a fan of public referenda as a way to decide major issues. So I have some... I mean, that is a more direct democracy route as opposed to representative democracy. But in this case, you know, and the abuse of referenda can be uh, that the majority uses its power to impose its will on the minority. So you should never be deciding important civil rights issues by referenda, in my opinion. This, to me, is something where it's not really a uh, – women are a majority in the state, and their rights were take, taken away. So I do think it's something – Maybe one of those rare circumstances where a public referenda does make sense. Um, I think it would pass. I think that's why the Republicans won't put it on the ballot, uh, because it would pass. Um, I'm not saying that uh, half the state uh, personally supports anyone ever ha uh, you know, ever getting an abortion. I do think a strong majority of people do believe that women should be able to make those decisions themselves, especially now that you know, I come across a lot of folks who have – uh, you know, I know someone or have personally dealt with such a situation, uh, be it like an ectopic pregnancy, be it a miscarriage where you have to have a DNC procedure where where women are now having to leave the state to get basic reproductive care. Um, you know, it's not a simple a black and white issue like Republicans sometimes paint it. I mean, it, uh, it sounds great to be pro-life. Who's not pro-life? But when you look at the complexities of each individual pregnancy, um, uh, you know, my wife went through a miscarriage with our first uh, our first attempt. We then had I had a son. We have another uh, child now on the way. Uh, but I know for each of these pregnancies she's had, it's been incredibly, comp incredibly complicated situation. The first miscarriage was was excruciating, and to put women in that situation, in a, like in a situation where they can't go to the doctors and expect to get you know the treatment that they might need in this state, in a state that's losing population. I yeah. I mean, I'll stand with Steve uh, Steve Williams every. A day of the week on that, you know, we need to restore those rights that were taken away. It's the first time we've taken away constitutional rights from, you know, people, people in this country. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a winning issue for Republicans just to say they're pro-life without realizing how just, you know, how many different situations arise in women's lives that make that, um, you know, make the legal outcome we have now very, uh, very unfortunate. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on the the border and, and that issue. Uh, thoughts on the border? Well. I'm not for a minute going to defend uh, the way the Biden administration handled the border in its early part of the administration. Uh, the border is a problem. Uh, you know, the notion that we don't need to have a secure border is one that you know I don't agree with. Um, but I'll give the president a lot of credit uh, for being willing to sign a border deal here a couple months ago that would have, would have given Republicans like 95 percent of the things they're normally asking for. Um, he offered to do that. You know, again, Senator Manchin was in the middle of a deal working with Senator Lankford uh, to co uh, come up with a compromise bill. Um, it had a lot of things that people like our fellow Senator, Senator Capito, are always talking about that they want to have. Uh, but then, you know, the former leader of their party uh, spoke out and said, you know, you can't vote for that bill. It's going to hurt me in November. And they walked away from a deal. Uh, they put their party and they put an election over the interests of the country. Um, you know, I wouldn't do that. I would have supported that deal. You know, it had stuff in it that, uh, you know, a lot of Democrats uh, might be uncomfortable with historically. Uh, but, you know, I think where we are at the border right now, that was a good deal. That was a, a deal that Republicans should have lined up to support, but they didn't do so because of politics. So, yes, uh, you know, I'm not going to defend the way the border has been handled, uh, but I will give credit where credit's due uh, when the president was willing to do, uh, do a deal that he might not have been willing to, uh, to do three or four years ago. Glenn, we're just uh, about out of time. Not quite there yet, but I want to ask you a, a simple question. Shouldn't take too much to, time to answer, and that is uh, Social Security and Medicare. I mean, you can do that in 60 seconds, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, look. <clears throat> Uh, both programs are facing, uh, if you look at their projected fiscal stability, you know, they're, uh, they're facing shortfalls here in, uh, you know, 10, 15 years. We have to figure out ways to shore them up. On the FICA tax, we have to look at increasing the cap. It's, I forget, it's in the $160,000 range now. That needs to go up a little bit. Uh, we have to look at ways to make the program more sustainable long term because these two programs have given – several generations of seniors in this country a dignified retirement and that's something that was not guaranteed before the 1930s people forget that you know a lot of folks of course the life expectancy was much younger then but you know a lot of folks you know would fall into very hard hard times if they didn't have immediate family to live with you had a lot of poverty among the elderly uh, you know that's what social security and medicare have fixed we have to keep them around um I did note that the Republican budget that was in Congress offered up, of course, is not going to become law, but it did uh, uh, pretty much include, you know, 
uh, non-specified cuts to entitlements like Medicare and security. Well, what are those cuts? What are those cuts going to look like? Now, they don't want to talk about that. You know, we have to shore up these programs. It's going to be painful, but we have to look at budgeting across the board. Uh, in the case of Social Security, you know, I'd look at expanding that FICA tax a little bit. You know, on that, uh, by lifting that cap alone could really go a long way in terms of, of, um, of, of stabilizing the program. And then you have... Uh, you have to look at getting more people paying into the FICA tax. You know, one thing we could do on the immigration deal is actually fix immigration so we actually create more legal pathways for people to come. And so instead of people working under the table, you have people actually paying the FICA tax. And no one wants to talk about that in terms of the immigration debate. But the best way to save Social Security and Medicare is to get more workers uh, being paid above board. You know, I kind of brought that up in a text with my co-host. We yesterday. call that legal immigration well, sure and we have that process it doesn't do, involve but it, but charging the border it needs to be reformed it is too slow of a well, process well yeah. yeah because everybody's distracted no because nobody wants to solve it so we can use it as a political football hey uh glenn you get the final minute why do you want to be the next senator from west virginia well look um you know i think uh, you guys have talked about it it's, it's going to be a tough year for democrats we need to put the best candidate uh, you know, on the ballot uh, going into the fall against the Republicans, it's going to uh, most likely be the governor. Um, you know, I'm the only one in this race who has any governmental experience. I have eight years as mayor of Wheeling under my belt. I worked for Senator Byrd for five years. It was my first job out of college. Uh, I'm also the only one in this race who's never been a Republican. Uh, you know, I'm a lifelong Democrat. And perhaps most importantly, I'm the one in this race who's been endorsed by organiz organized labor, uh, the, uh, the AFL-CIO, UAW, uh, CWA have all come out and support me. Uh, I also have the support of many mayors across the state. I believe I'm the consensus candidate who can take this fight through Republicans in the fall. It's going to be an uphill battle, but we need to be a unified party, and I'll do everything I can to, uh, to do that and make our, our party proud here in the fall. Glenn, thanks so much for your time this morning. Best of luck to you in the upcoming Democratic primary. Uh, thank you all. I enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. Glenn Elliott at uh, six, uh, sorry, 1029. And uh, remember, early voting ends Saturday. The primary election is May the 14th. We are back with Michelle Blatt, president of the State Board of Education, next. Sorry, superintendent of schools in West Virginia.